Assalamu alaikum and welcome to About Islam. I am your host, Layla Abdullah Pulos. Thank you so much for clicking the play button and joining me because this is going to be a phenomenal conversation around the elections. Every, all year long, we have been looking at all of these things about the election and it's been really a lot of stuff going on and around and everything like that. And so I wanted to just kind of like bring things down and ground a few things if we could. And so the person the person who's going to help me do that is Professor Shamika Mitchell with SUNY Rockland. She has decided to join me and help bring me down from all the stuff that's going around and, and give me some clarity. Assalamualaikum, Shamika, how are you? Alhamdulillah, wa alaikum salam. I am uh, very glad to be here. Thank you for uh, having me. Thank you for joining me because I have got to tell you, I am feeling it when it comes to this election. I am not a person that's really, really into politics. I'm one of those people that looks towards my friends <laughs> a okay. lot of times. Um, I spent a lot of years, like, you know, from the time I was able to vote, uh, I spent most of that time kind of not getting too deep when it comes to politics, learning as much as I can to kind of make my decision and only that, okay? And so I think there are a lot of people who kind of feel that way about it. But I, when I became Muslim, there were a lot of arguments about engaging in the voting process. Now, as, as an African-American, that was a given. You know, as soon as you can vote, you vote. You know, and there may be other aspects of it, of people being kind of feeling a little deflated about the candidate choices and everything like that. But a lot <laughs> of us were ingrained with this idea that it is important to engage in the political process at, at the level of being a voter. At Absolutely. Least. When I became Absolutely. Muslim, that kind of shifted and there were arguments that were kind of like different. So what are, what are some of the main things that Muslims are who are for voting saying and who are against voting saying? Uh, well, I think the biggest issue, even just in terms of the process of voting or, yeah, just, or why- Yeah, just deciding vote, to vote. Just in deciding to vote, um, I read a very interesting article that was coming out of, I think it was the Star Tribune, um, focusing on um, Latino voters in Texas. And one of the things that was mentioned in the article was that if you are a non-voter, more than likely you're around other non-voters. Mm. And it's also, it can be a generational practice where your grandparents didn't vote, your parents didn't vote, so you don't vote. Your friends don't vote. But people who are um, around other voters tend to also feel very obligated or um, involved in that process. And so I think depending on the Muslim population that we're talking about, <clears throat> if they were say immigrants who weren't yet able to vote, they may not um, participate. Um, but then you have populations that are, um, you know, I would say all American or native born, um, who maybe because of different voter suppression tactics, they were kept out of um, the polling places. And so there are a variety of reasons why people aren't just on that very fundamental level. From a religious perspective, you do have people who I would say are probably more conservative that would say like, if it's not chronically based, I'm not getting involved in the man's, you know, in human politics, I'm only interested in religious politics. And so uh, you do have that outside of um, Muslim populations too, where you have certain conservative religious um, groups that just don't get involved in civic life. Mm. Well, I, but it is part of religious politics. I mean, this is a dean. And if we're engaged in it, it impacts every aspect of our life. It affects every aspect of our lives including our, our secular political life. I mean, you, why would you think, why would we compartmentalize that? Why do we think that not engaging in, uh, poli in voting, not say politics, but voting, the whole <laughs> other thing about the po politics and, and becoming a politician and stuff, but voting, why do we associate not voting with 
being more Islamic or appreciating uh, or being more pious or appreciating uh, uh, Islam more if we don't vote? I think uh, I remember when I was in grad school um, that one of the other students in the MSA, um, you know, he and I were cool, you know, um, I was a little older and so I had a different worldview. Uh, and his perspective was if it's not pertaining to the Dean from a Hadith Quranic standpoint, then it's invalid. And so he felt that, you know, anything that was secular mm -hmm. was not at all a part of what it meant for him as uh, someone who was Muslim. Um, and I, I, you know, I respected that perspective. I disagreed, but I just said, no, like, you know, they're gonna pass laws that can send you to war. You, just, you might wanna vote to see who's gonna send you to war. Um, you they know, said the policy that's gonna impact your child's education, it's gonna yeah, impact your all health. These things. Um, and, you know, I, I think that depending on how you view yourself as engaged with, you know, American society, U.S. society, uh, you may feel that you have more at stake, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, it's kind of like um, when you think about like the Amish, right? They're not worldly in that sense. So them not participating in the elections, they're saying, well, we have our little enclave and we go with our horses and our wagons and we till the fields from sunrise to sunset, right? Um, and you do have certain populations um, of Muslims that are essentially established those kinds of enclaves where they wanna just come do their thing. They're not really getting mixed up in all the other stuff mm -hmm. um, or they try not to. I think the difficulty is that US politics and US history has been deeply rooted in um, religiosity and politicizing religion. And so whether we look at the 19th century, whether we look at the 16th century, whether we're looking at the 21st century that we're in now, you still see that religion goes um, right alongside with um, civic discourse. Well, it always has. I mean, we have, in God, we trust on our money. <laughs> the Prophet Muhammad uh, 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 is on the Supreme Court building, okay, a, 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 a sculpt, uh, what is it, a relief, relief? That's what it's called. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad is on the Supreme Court building. Our our country has always been duplicitous in its in its in its obvious in its surface of secularism, right? And so you know you have people, uh, uh, politicians in Congress using the Bible to justify slavery, holding the Bible upside down in the photo op, holding the Bible upside down in the photo op. So yeah, the religion has definitely been politicized. For me. Some of the pushback was coming from African Americans. Well, yeah, for other reasons. Okay. I I wouldn't say I don't I can't say for sure that it was relating to religious issues more than race and social justice issues. Okay. Because I have come across a number of um, African Americans in particular, not other folks within the African diaspora, who um, have talked about um, either the Eidos narrative of voting for uh, Trump in particular. Um, American or descendants of slaves. The American descendants of slaves, yes, Eidos. Um, I have my own feelings about Eidos for another day. Um, but then it's also pertaining to, you know, which candidate is gonna promise us more uh, reparations. And so that has been, um, and some of those people are Muslim. And so you, you, I've, I've come across black Muslims who, you know, are running, you know, they're on the Eidos train, which is, uh, an extension of the Trump train. And so, you know, they're just, as long as they can get their reparations or the promise of it, that's who they'll vote for. And then you have others who feel like both candidates are trash or leave a lot to be desired. So I'm not voting for either. And so, you know, the, I think there are those conversations to be had. I don't tell people how to vote. I do believe in mind your vote, um, who you vote for and why you choose to vote or choose not to vote. That's all on you. 
Uh, but, you know, as I said in a recent conversation, I had an interview um, last week and I said, look, if you don't vote, then you shouldn't have any complaints. You know, you can't say, oh, anything I, I, if you didn't vote. <laughs> right. If you didn't vote, then keep your complaints to yourself because you had every opportunity to express how you feel. Um, I think the biggest difficulty that we have now in this culture of absolutism is that if you don't agree a hundred percent with everything a candidate says, then, oh, that person isn't viable. And, yeah. you know, I think it's a part of this cancel culture nonsense that's out there mm. um, in which, you know, oh, somebody said something I disagree with, they're canceled. Uh, and that's not what cancellation should be. Um, that's not critical thinking. Yeah. Uh, and it's also understanding that there can be complexities. There can be complexities and nuances. For example, um, I I was supportive of the 1994 crime bill. I was supportive of the three strikes when it first came out. Why? Because I was what 18. Yeah. Um, yeah. and I'm seeing all my friends get, you know, shot at and stupidness going on. And we had done the stop the violence, hip hop movement. We had tried. And so our thing was, you know what, if you're getting in trouble three times, three strikes, you're out dummy. If you can't stay out of trouble, then maybe you need to find home in Sing Sing or Attica, you know, like mm. that's the way we saw it. We didn't realize that the agenda was going to be private prisons and let's make all this money off of people and criminalize it and criminalizing and um, mandatory minimums for yeah. walk for day walking like we didn't think that and, people and, and, and people who, who are dealing with drug addiction become criminalized yeah. right like that's not i think the 1994 crime bill i remember when it happened i was supportive of it when it happened um because i felt like you know what it's going to keep us away from all of these idiots who want to play okay corral shoot them up bang bang in a park with kids you know mm -hmm. this was the new jack city that i grew up in i'm from harlem so i grew up with the nino browns right i grew up with you know all of the stuff that people thought was like hollywood hype and it really wasn't so you watch New Jack City or you watch a couple of those other shows and it's like, no, we don't want that in our communities. And if they don't want to go to reform school and they don't want therapy and they don't want, you know, they just want to kill people and make money. Okay, fine. You need to go to jail. You need a timeout. You need a full 20, right? So they criminalize all, like they criminalize blackness. Right. They didn't criminalize people who were doing crimes. Right, and that was the thing that, you know, once it came into play and you look back at it, and then you see how they twisted what seemed to have come from a good place. These are, these are the things that make politics messy in terms of how they can turn things around, exploit things. And so there's a lot to be disenchanted about, but I think the, the, it still requires people to participate in the process of fixing where there were some um, holes and trying to shore up those resources where things are, um, you know, going well. And that's where I think um, like defunding the police, you know, there are some people that, you know, they have their own opinions about whether police, you know, should be defunded. Others want police completely abolished, <laughs> you know? And so it's like, if you don't have, okay. a, what, are, what are the policies that are make or break for you to support a candidate? And I think that's where we get our diversity as even among, um, you know, NBA Muslims. I think we have a lot of diversity there because I think class plays a role. Race absolutely plays a role. Um, and then, you know, what your vision is of where you are in the terrain. If you're in rural America, it's going to be very different terrain than it is in an urban environment. Yeah. And so even though you both may want certain things for Black people, Muslims, you know, or anyone who's underrepresented, the reality is that, you know, if you're in farmland America, it's going to be very different than it is if you're in a city. And if, and if you're if you're in a certain proximity to certain levels of privileged whiteness, is going to be different. As Absolutely, well. see things differently. Absolutely. And, um, maybe you don't consider this that there's a lot of stakes in it. I, I voting is not an easy thing. 
like you just mentioned, there are ramifications to each vote that you make. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing that cost benefit analysis of voting, okay, well, if, you know, if I voted for Obama as a Muslim, mm -hmm. should I then start to internalize some guilt because he was so good at uh, uh, droning Muslim countries? And that's where I think um, as an American, I would say we are the United States as an empire and we have to take ownership of what it means to be a, a member of that empire. Mm -hmm. And I don't care if we're talking about ancient Egypt during the time of Nebuchadnezzar and, you know, um, you know, uh, if we're talking about ancient Rome uh, with pick that Caesar, you know, if we're talking about an empire, uh, there's going to be things that we may not agree with, but at what, at what extent does it mean our comforts uh, have to be um, curtailed? And the reality is, I mean, you don't even have to think about the droning. I mean, I can go just straight to look, look at your clothing tags. Where are your clothes getting made? Made in Bangladesh, made in Malaysia. You think that they're getting honest wages? Mm. You think that they're getting fair labor practices? So when we think about what it means to be part of an empire, if we are, if we are taking seriously, I'm in the empire state, you're in the empire state, I am very clear on the fact that I am a citizen of an empire. And I may not agree with everything the empire does. And I try to do my bit to make sure that at least the people I have more direct contact with can be helped. But I realize that an empire is going to do what an empire is going to do. And that will mean droning. That will mean um, coups, like in Bolivia. You know, that will mean, you know, um, genocide that we turn a blind eye to. Mm. I can try to just make more zakat. I can try to, you know, engage more dua. But the reality is that unless you step outside of that empire, um, you can't wash your hands of it. But here's the here's the here's the catch: is people say, oh, you know, well then I'm going to just break up with the empire. That's fine. But no matter where else you go, you're tied to another empire history. Mm. They're all other than two countries in the world. Um, everyone else has colonial pasts yeah. and imperialism, imperialism is in the air and in the soil you stand on. So it's just a matter of how entrenched you are in it. And so I feel that's a part of the difficulty. I mean, if, you know, Muslim empires, we've got a few. And so when we look at it from an empire politics perspective, it's it for me, it's different because you see your position within a system, but also ways that you can try to work to um, do good for all of the harm that maybe the empire has done. Because the empire, again, it has to eat and, you know, it's going to eat somebody yeah. and you're no exception to the rule. And we well, have a eat you if you don't, if uh, it eats you anyway, eat you too. I mean, coming from an African-American perspective, you know, our people have been chewed up by oh, yeah. it, the, by America. Yeah. And we still had to live and engage in it. Mm hmm. When we weren't considered full people, when we weren't considered citizens under the dress, when we weren't considered Act. citizens, mm -hmm. when, we, when there was there were federal and individual state uh, uh, campaigns to deny us of our rights, our Absolutely. freedoms that still continue to this day. So we have to consistently engage in that process. Is it a matter of, do we not engage in the process at all and make ourselves vulnerable to other things that are happening in, right here, right now in the United States? You know what I mean? There's yeah. Local elections, there's state elections, there are federal elections. 
all of those things impact your lives. Yes, absolutely. And I would say that your your local elections um, are probably going to be more um, immediately felt. You know, who your mayor is, who your controller is, um, you know, folks in um, state assembly, I think we're going to be the ones that you have a more direct contact with. You'll probably see those people out and about campaigning. Um, and then on top of that, some of the policies that they are going to put forward or um, oppose are ones that are tied directly to you on the ground where you are. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, even the school board. Okay. So yeah, the school board is, oh, that's one of the most hotly contested in yeah. some places. There's a lot of power in that. That's why there's a lot of power in school boards. <laughs> oh yeah. People go to war over school zoning. Yeah. And I mean, even like now here in, in New York State, I'm not I I I I'm not gonna express an opinion about it, but what occurred was the whole idea of not allowing uh religious religion to be an excuse to not have your child vaccinated if they're going to attend a New York state public school. Mm-hmm. So before you were able to send in a letter, okay, because of my religion, I don't vaccinate my child. Okay. That stopped in New York state. A, a lot of Muslims did that. There were a lot of Muslims that did that. They, they, they used those letters. They did not want to have their, vac- their child vaccinated for whatever reason, their interpretation of religion, the, the, the vaccines that are available, their anti-vaxxers, whatever reason. There were a lot of Muslims who did that. Mm-hmm. So it's like voting or not voting in the people, not voting in the people that are impacting and making those decisions that are gonna directly affect your life, like you said, immediately, has its consequences to it. Absolutely. I think especially when you look at certain substantial voting blocks, um, when we speak about something like vaccinations, right, and being a part of school policy, you can encourage um, a tremendous amount of change. It's going to affect you whether you vote for somebody or not. So you might as well have a say. Um, But definitely, um, if you don't feel that you're connected, you know, if you're going to go move to a, a remote mountaintop somewhere, that can still be taken from you with them in it don't be rich you know Ruby so Ridge. yeah <laughs> they'll find you on that mountaintop too yeah so you know you still have to think about well you got to get there and yeah. you've got to stay there um i think even considering like what it means to be in a community or what it means to be part of a society you want to be able to make sure that you at least try to cause the least harm, but I know that there are people that are motivated by profits. And so whoever, you know, is going to have their taxes low, um, that may be who they go for. Others, it'll be a single issue like abortion Mm -hmm. or um, marriage rights, you know, and so everyone has something that's going to be near and dear to them. But I think um, across the board, you know, depending on what it is that you think um, is going to be helping you um, for Black Americans, in particular, all American um, NBA Muslims in more specific um, category, uh, we know that there can be a whole road of promises that lead nowhere. And so it's not that one party is a guarantee happy ending. We know that there is just, you know, they're going to be problems with both platforms. It's really a matter of which one is going to serve us the most. Yeah. Well, because Reagan uh, was the war on drugs. That was the yeah. war on drugs in Iran. Clinton. The biggest, he was the crack dealer. Yeah. Clinton. Okay. Were, were the super predators. Welfare reform. Welfare reform. The welfare model. So it definitely is not a thing where it's just like one party is going to necessarily automatically right give pay attention to or do anything for the needs of people based on race, religion, whatever. You also have to think about you know who their constituents are, and so that's what it means to try to govern a country of over 300 million people. Yeah. And, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things that we constantly forget about 
how many people there are here and what the terrain is like. The United States has deserts. The United States has mountains. The United States has complete vast farm prairie land and then big cities and then small town USA population of 1000. Mm -hmm. How can you come up with a policy that's going to make everybody happy? Yeah. It's not possible, but that's where state legislature becomes more important than maybe what's happening on the federal level. You think about the Native American reservations. You think about all the people that have, I mean, whoever is going to be elected president is president of everybody. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so that's where I think we lose sight of the other part of the rhetoric, which is there are a lot of us. And, you know, if you care about a certain policy, then you've got to get a group of concerned citizens together mm -hmm. to talk to your local reps, to push something through at the state level or the city level or the county level and grow from there. But it can't just be, oh, I'm an elephant or, oh, I'm a donkey. I mean, I'm, you and know. It can't just be um, for a lot of people. The people who have decided to back away, mm -hmm. to not involve themselves, all right, they really kind of have to rely on the people who are taking those chances. You know, this is my absentee ballot. ballot. I'm taking a chance with this ballot, though. I'm actually rolling up my sleeves and I'm saying I'm going to make a choice that choice is gonna impact everybody, including myself. So this is with over 300 million people. Out of the over 300 million people, there are less that have the right to actually get one of these mm -hmm. and use one of these, okay? And so when you decide that you don't wanna do it for whatever reason, do you think ultimately that they're depending on the people who have decided I'm going to do it I'm going, there's, 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 there are things that are at stake. And so I'm going to get my ballot or I'm going to go down to the polls. I'm going to fight all kinds of shenanigans mm -hmm. when it comes to voting, especially if you're a person of color. All right. That there's just really a lot going on in state by state to disenfranchise people of color. That's the one thing that African Americans always push back against. We're deciding, we're deciding to take that chance because we know that, yeah, we don't like this, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's going on that if we just sit back and we don't say anything at all, we're kind of allowing it to happen to us. Absolutely. If you're a passenger in the car, as opposed to helping to drive the car, you don't have much say over which direction or where the car goes. And so I look at voting and you know political engagement as a process in which you are behind the wheel mm -hmm. and you know the difficulty is that when you are behind the wheel you have to take ownership and so i think there were people who secretly voted in ways that they had regret you know they had buyer's remorse mm -hmm. um but in the end you know you have you have to live with that and That's i think the reality of voting that's the reality of voting is you have to live with whatever decisions you make. That we, yeah. people who decide to vote, anyone who does decide, any Muslim who decides to vote, you know, we have got to, we have got, we've got to kind of consider the fact that we don't have ultimate control, a lot of the control of everything. And we definitely do not have control over his creation. The only, the only thing we've decided to do when we do vote is to take the that 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 very distinctive power that we have through that right of enfranchisement yeah to at least assert a voice and make a decision that will hopefully end up with improvement in the way the country is run and in people's quality of life and everything like that but we also have the knowledge that not everything's going to end up that way and never no. has and never it, has and well, never but that doesn't mean that. But that doesn't mean that we've decided to then turn around and bail out of the process. Absolutely, those who have decided to bail out of the process have made a conscientious decision that you know what that right there, I don't. I may not want to deal with that because that's too much, or because ultimately I don't think it's going to make any impact. Whatsoever. Right. 
or and I personally may feel like my spiritual uh, mm -hmm. well-being is impacted if I make th this decision because I may feel like I, I will internalize every single mistake I think that 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 candidate made that I've that I helped vote into office type true. Of I mean, there is that. I think the other difficulty, um, you know, to get back to your um, point about taking responsibility and who's holding the bag, right? Um, with someone who's a passenger versus someone who's an active um, agent in their own political um, narrative. Uh, you know, the other issue has to do with the fact that it's not as if a candidate is saying, vote for me so I can drone people vote for me so I can starve people out. They're giving you the promises kind of like in, you know, um, certain relationships, right? That someone is saying, oh, I'll be good to you, yeah. right? Both They're not saying, oh, like thousands of people die after the levees break in New Orleans. Right. <laughs> you know, they're not saying, oh, you know, I'm going to do these other bad things because they wouldn't get your vote. They're going to bring their best game and, and, and speak in ways that the people that they want, whose votes they want, mm -hmm. they're going to get. Right. And I'm I not, think- I'm not questioning their veracity when it mm -hmm. comes to it, but you're right. The fact is that that's exactly what they're going to do. Oh yeah. And I think it's- Don't so make mistakes like George Bush Sr. You know? Okay. Well, he was honest. <laughs> it's the minute he got honest, he didn't get reelected. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. One term president, one term, one term president. Uh, but I think that's the same thing, you know, when we think about black, um, black voters, in particular, um, Muslim voters, that, that they may see that there's no one happy place, right? And I think you have to look at somebody, um, you know, like Ilhan and say, you know, she still has to play ball, you know, she, I, I, I appreciate what she represents. I appreciate what she does. You know, she's not, you know, rep in New York State. But I also realize that, um, you know, we need more people that want to step into the fray, um, and maybe represent a lot of bravery for her to do it. Alternative narratives. I, I saw the documentary at Tribeca Film Festival when she first ran. Um, and that was, a, you know, I was surprised, you know, to see um, all that she had to overcome in order uh, to earn the position that she wound up, you know, holding that seat um, for all this time now. What and, happened after? Right. You know, that she had to be, she was brought to heel. And um, I think there's something to be said about, you know, the, the way that generational shifts occur in politics when you choose to become a, you know, a politician for your wages. It's not the same as, you know, being the president of the PTA, for example, you know, that's, there's no, um, there's no same kind of political consequence with PTA leadership as there's once you say that you're going to run for Congress or Senate, um, and then you have now people's votes and you have money and you have always to raise more money. And so that's where we see our political landscape today with these million dollar campaigns. And it's all going to just be opportunities for corruption. Now, you said black, black Muslims, all right? Yeah, I think that black Muslims in particular are going to see somebody like Ilhan and say, oh, she's fantastic. You know, but whether or not um, they see themselves in her in comparison to, um, you know, somebody that um, is in their home state, yeah, you know, they may be a, a few and far between, you know, if you're in Iowa or Idaho or, <laughs> you know, well, it's I like, know. there's some, they're popping up in uh, are. State, state, are. state assemblies and, and, and stuff like that. But yeah. I'm just wondering along the lines of, first of all, every almost every election year is supposed to be a monumental election year. Mm -hmm. This year, how much of it is vitriol and how much it is really a lot at stake that we have to worry about as American voters? So when you're thinking along the lines of those cycles of oppression, suppression, having to deal with uh, all kinds of crisis, healthcare crisis, uh, natural disasters and everything like that. That's something that constantly occurs 
all the time in American society. And yeah. so how, why is this election year so important if all that's gonna happen anyway? What's so important about this election year that may be someone who generally thinks I'm gonna stay out of it because it doesn't really make a difference. Um, I just really don't wanna be involved in the process. I'm dealing with Corona right now. I really don't want to be thinking about these fools and who I'm going to vote for, anything like that, for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Why is this election year so important that maybe they should consider involving in the in the vote, involving themselves in the voting process? Well, I think what makes it more critical this year, even in comparison to last year, uh, has to do with the tenor of um the current white house leadership i think the two-party system is an issue and i think that um now people are seeing the need to change um a two-party system because it can be so deeply flawed i think also that the two the two parties that are standing now um as democrats and republicans they're also having to re-examine who their voters are and whether or not they can have platforms that are accessible to a broader base and so that means that more people can have a seat at the table or have a word or two cents that are added into the conversation. And so we're seeing um, political re reform in that way. Uh, we're also seeing that um, there will be a public health issues um, that will continue um, to exacerbate if it isn't curtailed. And this current administration does not have an investment in um, curtailing the virus or in protecting American lives. And that's also something worth noting. Um, I think also in terms of immigration reform, we find that democratic policies tend to be more favorable and inclusive towards immigration reform. Uh, it was under Obama that there was this intent to close Guantanamo, uh, where I think you had a good number of Muslims that were being held, um, I would say illegally. Uh, we also have a lot of detention centers throughout the country that are housing children and housing and splitting up families. Uh, and all of that uh, comes into play with how we vision America in the 21st century. And so, so people who are concerned about their livelihoods, concerned about public health, education reform, Betsy DeVos has been absolute trash for um, American education. The United States continues to fall in the global scale. These are the things that we don't want to see continue. And I mean, at the end of the day, when you think about things, about those cyclical things, especially when it comes to things like those natural disasters that we are, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that we have to go through, health, the things like pandemics and everything like that, who's sitting in those seats to make those decisions becomes very, very important and a matter yeah. of life and death. There's a lot that you end up having to think about. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Filling and those it's, squares. Yeah. And it's that's scary. the work. And see, that's the work that when we talk about what it means to be, um, and I don't want to diminish people who aren't citizens, but who are still very, you know, involved members of our society. But that is a part of the responsibility of what it was intended to be um, a citizen. And that if you are a citizen, then you are fully engaged in civic life. And so that when they curtailed it and said, it's only for men, it's only for men who have money, it's only for men of a certain race, you know, but then it was like, oh, it's this VIP section, right? Only certain people get a chance to participate in that area of our life. They get to tell us what the decisions are. We don't get to make any of the decisions or participate. And that has changed. And so I mean, it hasn't flipped a hundred percent, but I mean, status quo is status quo, you know, and money in a capitalist society is always going to prevail. And so, yes, when we talk about political machines, someone like Cuomo, yeah, you know, you've got to be, you know, a part of that cohort if you plan to have a career in politics. Yeah. I think the difficulty is that there may be some things that you wound up signing off on that maybe didn't work out, or maybe at the time it was short-sighted, Maybe, you know, you're going to have regrets about the way certain things get put through. I mean, there are all of these other aspects. So it's just a matter of being able to feel that you at least aired 
something um, to the powers that be, but not necessarily that you're captaining the ship. And I think that's the difficulty and that's the work that's required. And so for people who wanna vote or who are thinking about voting or have dilemmas about voting, the real issue is the responsibility that it comes with. You've gotta own it. And some people, you know, they wanna just be on the sidelines and they'll be happy to reap the benefits, but not, but if there are consequences, they can say, well, that's your fault, you know, but that you can say, well, it's your fault too, because you but could have- But all consequences, is it? That's the thing. There are levels. It's never all consequences, no matter who you vote for. There's going to be consequences. There's going to be consequences, but it won't be exclusively consequences. And it depends on where you are. So here's yeah. something that I told some of my friends and, you know, people consider me bourgeois. I consider my, I'm, I'm bourgeois, so what, right? And one of the things that I had said to some of my friends one time, I said, you know, the people who fly first class and have fancy lunches and shop in Bloomies, they're going to still shop in Bloomies no matter who's president. Like it's, it's not changing whether or not you're hitting the, you know, the boutique for, you know, your new shoes or your new bag. The people who are going to travel are going to still travel. I mean, COVID restrictions not included. I said, but, you know, the people who really are affected by this are the ones who are more economically vulnerable. They're the ones who maybe um, have more political marginalization. They're the ones who have the most skin in the game. You know, I mean, the folks who like, I'm a professional, you're a professional, right? Like, we have a certain level of comfort that folks who are hourly wage workers working at Walmart and these other places, working three jobs, triple shifts, you know, just to be able to make rent, they're the ones who really need to be out there, but they're so overworked that they might not get a chance to get to the polls. And so voting then becomes a very bourgeois exercise for a lot of people, because a lot of the people who are going back and forth about this one or that policy, they're not the ones who are really going to feel it when they come up with certain policies and decisions. I think the people who are, you know, uh, uh, you know, very seriously poor, um, the people who are um, the working poor, I think they're the ones who are going to feel these economic policies the most. When you decide to vote, you're asserting your voice and you also have uh, consequences that you have to face because of it when you decide not to vote you're asserting your voice and you also have consequences yeah <laughs> that you but have to face consequences with. that you can live with i think the biggest takeaway is that whether or not you decide to vote we have a system that needs voters in it I, but i think there's a crisis of faith that some that yes we're going through when it comes to the decision I mean, it's not a it's not a, a an easy one in sense of I really don't want to make it. As an American voter, mm -hmm. honestly and truly, if I wanted to be honest and true about it, I don't want to make this decision. Why? There's so much behind this decision that it scares me. Like honestly, it does. And Right now, at this very moment, I feel like I am not informed enough. That's why I'm going to have to hit up all my political friends. <laughs> That's why I brought you on. Because I'm like, listen, this, this, this is in a week. A week, right? In a week. And am I ready? Now, this is, this is coming from a person who, has a, who belongs to a heritage of voters. Mm -hmm. Okay. My African American family voted <laughs> right? in the South. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I'm still like viscerally, I don't want to do it. So I can totally understand the people that don't want to do it. I think I think that my my sense of responsibility to engage in the process overwhelms that fear. But I can totally understand that fear. Is it going to sit right with the law? And uh, is it going to sit right with the law if I don't vote? Because this is my way of trying to make some kind of change, and I decided not to make it. You know, well, I, think I do the crisis of faith that a lot of Muslims feel when it comes to voting. And I think that's a legitimate concern across the board for anyone that has 
you know, a shred of morality um, and a sense of awareness of themselves outside of themselves in a bigger society with a bigger picture. So here are a couple of things. And the first is what does it mean to be a good neighbor? Right. And being a good neighbor might mean that you have to take ownership of certain um, political narratives um, and try to quell other political narratives. Um, to be a good neighbor might mean that you vote against your best interest, right? Mm -hmm. So you might like a certain tax plan because you're in a certain tax bracket, but you know that that policy is going to hurt a lot of other people who are more vulnerable than you. Um, I have voted against my best interest before, you know, um, and there are times when I try to support policies, maybe that aren't looking out for me in particular, but are looking out for people that I feel need to have more advocacy than they do yeah. in our political landscape. And so I try to sometimes use my votes in a way to do that kind of charity, in addition to giving actual charity. Um, I have voted against my best interest at times. And so there's something to be said about the need for um, people to look at voting as something that is not necessarily a reflection of themselves only, but can also be an extension of their intention to their community, you know? And so if there's something that's gonna hurt farmers in the Midwest, I mean, what do I know about chickens, right? But I may not support something because it's gonna hurt farmers in the Midwest. And, and maybe I care about them needing chickens. You know, um, I think there's something to be said about, you know, what's happening with immigration reform. That's the other part of what it means to be participating in civic life is that it's not all about you. There has to be a, an effort to get informed. And so I appreciate you asking those kinds of questions because these are the conversations people usually don't want to have because it's more homework, right? Mm -hmm. And voting is supposed to be this singular, like fill out this bubble, fill out that bubble, mail it in. But instead it's like, okay, so whose policies am I going to be most aligned with? Thank you so much for- Thank you. I think this is so very important. And I think that whether or not you decide to vote, the, the fact of the matter is, is that this is something that if you decide to, you're gonna have an impact on society. If you decide not to, you're gonna have an impact on society. Either way, what candidates do or don't do. And don't forget on the other side, look on the back of your voting cards because there are other policies. You're not just voting for the, the politicians, right. you're voting for the policies too. Absolutely. And that I think- you're making an, an, an impact and you can't sit back and say, well, I did not vote for that person because right. not voting for someone has just as, many, as much consequence as voting for someone. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank and you. Look out for the next About a Slam. And if you vote, if you got your absentee ballot, fill it out, send it out. If, if you're voting, go out there and vote. Help wow. someone who wants to know how to vote, vote. If you're politically inclined and you have those friends who are not politically inclined hitting you up, talk to them. Have mercy upon us. <laughs> Inshallah. Jazakallah khairam. Assalamu alaikum.